Greetings once again. Welcome to another essay video. This time I'm going to be breaking down a more specific horror-related title in the video game industry. Dead by Daylight, a popular title that's been going through some highs and lows over its development. Developers claim it's the Hall of Fame of Horror, and as I've been playing the game, I've noticed that the elements to the game change over time, a test that multiplayer games often have trouble with. At first, I would have just brushed this off. Not a lot of multiplayer horror games can keep players scared. Then I realized a few elements that do make Dead by Daylight a horrifying experience in specific circumstances, for better or worse. The question at hand is whether Dead by Daylight has an identity crisis. Is it truly a horror game? I'll break down a couple points, just like my last video, on what the game has going for it. Art direction, sound, and gameplay. I'll also break down the basics of the game for those that haven't heard of Dead by Daylight or have heard of the game but just haven't played it. Lots of patches have been dropped since I started making this video, so some things are bound to have changed in the footage. In fact, a couple characters got released as DLC shortly after I started writing the script. Most of the footage I've gathered to research my points are going to be in the perspective of the survivor side as opposed to the killer side. The simple point being that the killer shouldn't be the scary side of things. It's in the name after all. It's important to know that I won't be deciding on whether Dead by Daylight is a good or bad game based on my findings, as that's a different subject altogether. That's not the ultimate goal here for this video. The main question to figure out is this. Is Dead by Daylight actually a horror game? Let's find out. Before we get into the specifics, I want to break down the basics of Dead by Daylight for those that haven't played the game so far. For those of you who are familiar, you can skip to this point in the video. Dead by Daylight is an asymmetrical game that pits four players against one player. You have two sides to pick from. You can be the survivors or be questionably sane as you play the killers. Survivors are a team of four players that must avoid the killer's grasp as you repair five generators, of which there are a total of seven generators placed on the map. Then you must proceed to the nearest gate and open it so you and your temporary friends can escape. Now during the match, you have several options if you are being chased by the killer, as you can buy yourself time and distance as your friends repair the generators. There are windows and pallets that will create distance for you if managed well. Windows allow survivors to vault using the wall to make distance, while pallets allow survivors to stun the killer if they are in range. Manage these well, as others will have to use them as well. Practice makes perfect. Generators take a while to fix, but other survivors can help in speeding the process up. Ideally, some survivors will keep the killer busy while others finish the main objective. Other times, they'll just have to rescue their teammates before that hook survivor loses another life and goes into a second phase where a QTE pops up. If they fail it, then time is taken away. This QTE pops up randomly during most actions that don't involve running around the map. The only time it's guaranteed is when the killer is carrying you or you are on the hook in a second phase. Killers are on their own and must befriend as many survivors as possible and prevent them from powering the generators by any means necessary. In order to do that, you must befriend a survivor twice in order to catch them and place them on a hook as a countdown begins for their demise. Survivors have essentially three lives that are measured by the hook timer before they are removed from the match by the killer. During the match, killers can track survivors two different ways, the simple way being patrolling, patrolling the Mojave almost, almost makes, makes you wish, wish for a nuclear, nuclear winter. winter. But you can also find survivors that are sprinting around the map by tracking the scratch marks left behind temporarily. They are visualized by their bright reddish-orange light. From there, the chase is the difficult part, as it is a battle of minds. This means killers will have to either beeline in a straight line after the survivor, or fake movement to bait a mistake. This is due to the killer's line of sight being visualized by a red light in the survivor viewpoint. Just like vaulting in pallets, practice makes perfect. Now, if you're feeling lucky as survivors, you may also find items in chests around the map, such as med kits to heal yourself or your friends, or yourself, repair kits to speed up generator progress or sabotage the killer's tools, flashlights to blind the killer, results may vary. There are also maps to mark important objects, and keys to open a secret hatch that spawns after some of your friends have departed from this realm. If the killer finds the hatch and closes it, or if the gates are opened for survivors to escape, a timer starts called the end game collapse. If a survivor does not escape before time runs out, they are immediately sacrificed. The biggest difference between both sides is this. The killer's view is vastly different in comparison to the survivor's third person camera, first person versus third person. The last thing to bring up for the basic is at the menu for both sides. See these slots here? 
These are perk slots that alter the abilities your survivor or killer has that can change up the gameplay slightly or dramatically. The same applies to the items and abilities for both sides. They change certain attributes of the item or ability. Perks can change the game dramatically to heal survivors instantly after a short period of time. For the killer, these slots can allow the killer, or at least for some killers, to be able to one-shot a survivor with ease. You can get perks and add-ons by using blood points, a currency given just by playing the game. You can spend these in the blood web to purchase items. They're add-ons and perks for your characters. The killers differ vastly in their abilities, while the survivors are more or less cosmetic and don't really do anything different. You only really need to level different survivors to get their perks so you can put them on other survivors. No matter the result of the game, the goal is to get as many blood points as possible to progress your cast of characters. Alright, that's the basics of Dead by Daylight, so with all that out of the way, let's get into the rest of the topic at hand. I don't think it's a stretch to say that Dead by Daylight's art team nails it out of the park almost every time. To start off with the survivor designs, I'll be sticking to the non-licensed characters because I think that's where the art team really shines. Survivors are given dark colors and this gritty design on their clothes, while their facial expression and body language give an insight into their personality. Characters like Fang, Ace, and Meg have a confident stance and expression while characters like Dwight Claudette look like they're on edge. Dwight Blight 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 Blight? Oh god, Dwight's the Dwight is the Blight. <laughs> Dwight bites his nails and Claudette puts her hand to her chest. Little details like that add a lot to these characters. An update changed the graphics on these characters to add some detail to them. But it looks like they lost detail that added to the atmosphere, but gained some animation in the menu for their characters. Killers, on the other hand, have a very different set of animation for each character that gives you a very unique set of how they function with their powers and their characteristics. Some being more over the top than others. The survivors are fairly basic with some attire and items on them to give an idea to their profession or lifestyle. For example, Serena has an audio recorder and pen to indicate her career as a documentarian and Yui wears heavy boots from her street racer career. The killers, on the other hand, are vastly different from each other, ranging from their base cosmetics showing their origin to some extent by their clothing or armor, and some having an exotic design due to the unnatural realm Dead by Daylight takes place in. The hag is a particular one to highlight as she's, well, barely got anything on and looks ghoulish. Would you be surprised if I told you she was a cannibal? Probably not. Each killer has a backstory that gives you an idea as to how they became what they are now. Funny enough, some of them don't like killing at all, but believe that it's a necessary action. On to the maps. Dead by Daylight focuses on dark colors like green or blue for that nighttime atmosphere to give that eerie feeling in some of its maps. Some maps that used to be darker got an update in daylight to change things up. Wait, the map is set in daylight? <laughs> Joking aside. The daylight maps are okay. They don't offer that dark atmosphere, but they do the job regardless, with some environment giving more weight to the map. There's also items you can use to add fog to the map, but I haven't noticed any difference when they've been used. And if I'm being honest, it doesn't add anything to the map's atmosphere. Like I said, the art team really knocks things out of the park, especially with their original killers. I love these designs and adore when this art team goes beyond their lengths for originality. My personal favorites being the Oni and Doctor. Of course, this game wouldn't be able to build tension without a certain aspect to fill the atmosphere. Sound in Dead by Daylight is utilized in the game mainly for situational awareness. Killers mostly have to listen for injured survivor noises, footsteps if possible, and noises that are considered out of place, 
such as locker doors moving or crows making noise due to a survivor's movement. One thing players can read up on killers for survivor gameplay in terms of sound is their terror radius, often mixed up by meters of up to 40 meters or 6 meters at the very least. Most killers are being set to 32 meters. The terror radius is what survivors hear as a warning to the killer's approach, which is accompanied by music and a heartbeat sound that intensifies the closer the killer gets. It can get your blood pumping if you're unsure of where the killer is actually coming from as the terror radius isn't directional. The special case being the Huntress and Freddy Krueger, both of which have a lullaby being hummed. The dredge that causes a nightfall ability removes their terror radius with, um, well, it's, it's better if I show you. When Dead by Daylight launched in 2016, there were only three killers. Trapper, Wraith, and Hillbilly. All three of them shared the same terror radius music. Now the problem comes to the fact that Dead by Daylight is a multiplayer game, and eventually the sound becomes second nature, rarely playing into making the player scared. It's possible, but, but not very probable. Most of the sound effects are to warn survivors or just give information on what's happened. One way killers could get the drop on survivors through the use of sound is by removing their terror radius altogether. Some perks have been nerfed to allow stealth killers to excel, and it's added to that horror value for Dead by Daylight. But there are so few killers that can utilize stealth on their base kit. For example, Ghostface can shut off his terror radius whenever, unless a survivor stares at him for a couple seconds. Wraith, who can ding don a bell to go invisible and remove his terror radius, only to hit his bell again unless he uses an add-on to make it silent. Michael Myers starts out with a 6 meter terror radius until he charges his ability by staring at survivors or uses add-ons to restrict himself in movement speed, but is able to see survivors through walls. And the Onyo, who's given me a jump or two, Starts out with no terror radius as she is in a form that makes her pop in and out of reality to get the jump on survivors. And then there's Spirit, who can warp out of reality with a sound that mirrors that of an air conditioner. And catches survivors off guard if she can track them down. I would add Demogorgon to this list, but his ability to make portals and become undetectable after using them is so short it's almost useless in any scenario. The problem is that this only happens sometimes, as players won't always be facing these killers. Facing a different killer that is more in your face is a nice detraction from the stealth killers, but if it's the more common killer to face, then the value of horror is lost, and the more competitive form takes its place. I get it. Stealth gameplay is not for everybody. And in Dead by Daylight's case, it's probably not the best way or the fastest way to keep generators unmanned. The other time players can be scared by killers is with a couple of debuffs that come into play called Oblivious and the killer variant called Undetectable. This means the terror radius is considered moot to the survivor and has no warning for the killer's approach until they remove the debuff. A couple perks off the top of my head allow this to happen. Hex Plaything, a perk that makes a hook survivor become oblivious so they must destroy a totem to remove the debuff. Hysteria, which makes all injured survivors become oblivious for 30 seconds whenever a healthy survivor is injured. Nemesis, which causes a survivor who stuns the killer to become oblivious for 60 seconds. And then there's my personal favorite, Dark Devotion, which makes the killer undetectable for 30 seconds if they hit the survivor marked as an obsession. Dark Devotion also makes the terror radius follow that survivor. It's an effective strategy to keep survivors on their toes. Obviously none of these perks actually work in an open area of the map where survivors can spot you. Starts looking like that scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail at that point. Ha -ha! Hey. Hey. Ah! 
This could just be an anecdotal thing, but I really wish the game utilized its stealth capability more. For example, let's make the killer start out as undetectable individually until they encounter said survivor, so that their music doesn't immediately give them away. The thing about the original killers having the same music before they were patched up kept the mystery going as to what killer was to be expected. Something to keep things interesting at the start. While Dead by Daylight does have a good utilization of sound for those that might prefer a stealthy approach, the gameplay differs quite a bit. Excluding the thrilling gameplay of repairing generators, that being holding down one button and occasionally doing a QTE skill check, let's focus on the other aspect of Dead by Daylight's gameplay, the asymmetrical nature of the game pitting one killer against four survivors. Let's look at the hunt aspect. The unique aspect of gameplay is the camera view for both sides. Killers are restricted to the first person camera, while survivors have the third person camera, allowing them to hide behind cover and look around the corner. It's a unique and interesting way as I use this more often than expected just to get information on the killer's location, sometimes getting jumped by the killer being right behind me. Despite all these mechanics, this is where the positives end as it becomes problematic to see killers have all this power but only be challenged by running in circles and stopped by pallets. Gee, don't let them go to a warehouse. They'll be screwed once they see how many pallets are in stock there. Oh. Never mind. Minus the nurse, a killer who can blink through objects, and spirit who can phase out of vision and move at fast speeds, most killers have to deal with running in circles or near pallets. The whole concept of Dead by Daylight is that the killers are working, reluctantly or otherwise, for a cosmic force that commands pretty much everything in the realm. This entity is called... The Entity. Okay. Unless I'm missing something, wouldn't the Entity not want the survivors to be able to use these tools or even be able to save each other with it? Maybe the Entity will be less displeased by these efforts? <laughs> Now, the developers have made a character that's only been named but not seen yet, Vigo, who apparently, according to the lore, has researched the entity and managed to create his own tools and devices, so I'll concede that point for the game's lore. So let's take a look at the pallet system in a gameplay aspect. There's two types of pallets to use, a safe pallet and an unsafe pallet. Safe pallets are the ones that are best utilized to keep the killer busy as generators are completed. Sometimes there are windows to extend the chase time as well. Unsafe pallets have a very short distance, and risk the survivor getting hit by the killer in the process. Unfortunately, this means the unsafe pallets on some maps are right next to each other given about, uh, we'll say about 10 meters. So basically, survivors can drop one pallet and then move on to the next, and so on and so forth until all generators are completed. One could argue that they are there for the sake of balance. Fair enough, I'd say. But why are the pallets and vault windows so close to each other in some maps? Seeing them so close together doesn't really add to the threat of the killer if a survivor can just jump to the next area of the map without even getting close to damage. Sure, I could manage to fool threats in games like Outlast or Amnesia, but not so much to the point that I stop feeling like the monsters, or killer in this matter, is a threat. Again, a challenge multiplayer or horror games struggle with, but I wouldn't say it's an impossibility. Killers that have powers dedicated to dominating the chase get to shorten how much time it takes to catch survivors, thus making them better than others in a competitive fashion. It's important to note on the same menu where you read up on the terror radius, there's also a movement speed for killers. Most of them are set to 4.6 meters, and some are set to 4.4 meters per second due to their ability. Most of which being killers that can attack you from range. And I will say, when there is a good killer in your match, the game can get scary from time to time. The key word being can. Personally, I'd prefer seeing various environments with different models according to the map, marked with a bright color like yellow or bright red, so that survivors know that they could be pulled down like a pallet in a desperate attempt to survive. In all honesty, I'm unsure how to feel about this part of the game after watching some killers run in a circle after a survivor. With these mechanics, Dead by Daylight becomes more of a competitive game than horror game. Then again, Dead by Daylight relies on a skill-based matchmaking system, so that's probably the point. 
Compared to another multiplayer game like Damned, where four survivors face one killer in a darkly lit house with a haunting ambience is a far more terrifying scenario than Dead by Daylight scenario. In Damned, survivors only have a sprint duration and flashlights requiring batteries, so the only option is to run and hide as most of the killers in Damned use powers to find survivors with traps, and then are required to physically search where survivors ran off to. Chase music only plays for survivors if they see the killer. Survivors can use doors to block off killers, but can be overpowered if they're not careful. But I digress. The point is that Dead by Daylight's gameplay is much more focused on being competitive than horror. With its skill-based matchmaking in place, it's hard for Dead by Daylight to shine as a horror game. I am a little curious as to what would happen if Dead by Daylight had a casual mode, or a mode that did not allow perks to be used at all. Regardless, Dead by Daylight focuses on being competitive as it can only sometimes catch players off guard. Whether it's the stealth killers, the hags traps jump scaring players, or that tension in a chase as survivors attempt to escape. Facing a good killer can spark that dreadful feeling of fear. It's just not a feeling that happens often to qualify Dead by Daylight as a horror game in terms of its gameplay factors. The first few hours in Dead by Daylight as a survivor might get your blood pumping as killers take out their opposition, but the test of time takes its toll on many multiplayer games, and this one is not excluded from that test. Players might be able to get some horror value out of the game in some matches, but it seems to be very few and far between. It'd be a commendable trait if Dead by Daylight actually managed to be a scary and fun competitive game with its stellar art direction and sound effects. The gameplay, however, seems to toss that away, mainly the sound part, for a more competitive nature. It's fun with friends, sure, but most games can be fun when you're playing with friends, even the bad ones to some extent. Other games tried to copy what Dead by Daylight does to some extent, like VHS or Friday the 13th for example. Even the same company that made Dead by Daylight tried again with Death Garden. The saving grace for Dead by Daylight is the replayability of just coming across different killers for each match, and that chance of different results. However, if I'm being honest, it's probably because the developers are constantly releasing DLC survivors and killers with new perks and abilities. You could argue this is an effort to stay relevant due to the gameplay pretty much boiling down to the same routine, complete generators and practice making circles with the killer. But as I said in the beginning, this is about whether Dead by Daylight is a horror game. With the matchmaking in place, survivors could come across a stealth killer looking to scare players, or a killer going full force with their chainsaw, or it could be one just looking for a bartender. No seriously, he let me go. So in conclusion, Dead by Daylight just isn't a horror game despite recent patches that made killers a little bit more powerful, with faster pallet breaking speed, slowing down generator speeds, and more built-in base kits for map pressure. It's probably more appropriate to say Dead by Daylight is a horror-themed kind of game. Its audio and art direction offer an idea of a terrifying concept, survivors stuck in a realm created by a cosmic force with no way out. With all the time I spent in this game, I can't say confidently that Dead by Daylight is a horror game, as the gameplay factors outweigh the rest of the game's build and pretty much defeat the purpose of the killer's threat for a more competitive form. I'm not saying I should be jump scared every time I come across the killer, more so that I want to actually feel nervous like a clock is ticking for my demise, only to be able to rise above it as a survivor with a team to make victory taste that much sweeter. Thanks for watching. If you like what this video brings, consider hitting that like button. If you didn't, there's a button for that as well. At the time of this video's making, there's been a rather big problem with cheaters in Dead by Daylight, and though I didn't see any, I don't doubt the problem is present. If you'd like to see more Dead by Daylight related content, here's a few channels I recommend heading to. Let me know in the comments if you'd like me to review Dead by Daylight in a more overall kind of way, or if there's anything I missed from my previous points that you want me to address. So until next time, this is Arsenal, signing off.